My name's Tim Buse. Welcome to the second day of uh, Political Concepts, the Science Edition. Um, our two speakers today are talking about environment and future, respectively. Etienne Benson teaches in the Department of History and Sociology of Science at the University of Pennsylvania. His published scholarship includes his 2010 book, Wired Wilderness, Technologies of Tracking and the Making of Modern Wildlife from Johns Hopkins University Press. And he will be speaking about environment. Joanna Radin teaches in the uh, Department of History at Yale University, as well as in the program in the History of Science and Medicine. Her books include Life on Ice, a History of New Uses for Cold Blood, which is from University of Chicago Press in 2017. Her concept is future. Let's uh, go into it. Etienne will speak first. Uh, so uh, this has been a real pleasure, really stimulating um, workshop so far. Um, what I'm going to share with you is some, not exactly an excerpt from, but some thoughts drawn from a book project that I'm trying to finish up, which is a kind of uh, history of the environment as a concept. <clears throat> so. As a term, environment today is undoubtedly <clears throat> excuse me, political in the same way that we might think that terms like welfare or trade are political. That is to say, in the US and many other countries, since at least the 1970s, environment has been one of those terms that is clearly seen as a legitimate and even a central subject for political debate, one that politicians and voters use to establish affiliations, express identities, and formulate policies and, and policy preferences. And of course, there's a sense in which, um, as environmentalists often claim that it should be, the environment as an issue is non-political, or at least non-partisan. Very few people would say that they are opposed to the environment or environmental quality in any general sense. People of poli particular political persuasions are certainly proudly anti-environmentalist. But I think no one outside of maybe the most un uncompromising nihilist would claim to be proudly anti-environment. Even Donald Trump claims that he cares about, the, <laughs> cares about the environment, just not in the way that environmental extremists do. The 2016 Republican Party platform was as radically anti-environmentalist as you might imagine. Its basic message was that the environment is actually improving, there is no crisis, and where it isn't improving, the solution lies in strengthening private property rights. But interestingly, it tried to have its cake and eat it too, claiming that the Republican Party actually, quote, pioneered environmentalism a century ago in the form of conservation. And also asserting that, quote, the environment is too important to be left to radical environmentalists. So we might be tempted to attribute some bad faith to such statements, but the fact that uh, Trump and the Republican Party felt the need to include at least pro forma endorsements of some variety of environmentalism, or perhaps more precisely, an anti-environmentalist commitment to protecting the environment, still tells us something. It tells us that even for the most extreme anti-environmentalists, what's open to debate about the environment is not the idea that there is an environment, nor is it the idea that the environment is important and even essential. On that. Mat on those matters, people across the political spectrum seem to agree. So what's generally recognized as political about the environment is its current status or qualities, whether it's improving or, dec or declining, whether climate change is a hoax or not, um, and how it should be protected or treated, whether through extending gov uh, government regulation or protecting private property and so forth. Now, much of the scholarship in the history and sociology of environmentalism, which is an area that I work in, um, adopts this fairly limited sense of the politics of the environment. Such works sometimes acknowledge that environment, per se, was not always a subject of concern. They talk about, for instance, yes. um, people can't hear you. oh, sorry, oh. sorry, thank you, uh, sorry about that. So much of the scholarship in the history and sociology of environmentalism adopts this fairly limited sense of the politics of the environment. Such works sometimes acknowledge that environment was not always a subject of concern. For instance, they talk about how environmental quality first became a widespread concern in the 60s and 70s, and how they complemented uh, or replaced earlier concerns with nature conservation or protection. And they might discuss changes in the scope of environmental concern, for instance, the introduction of climate as a, as a central environmental concern, uh, or, the, or understandings of the direction of environmental change. 
What they do not discuss as a rule, and certainly nowhere in any uh, depth, is what the environment is as such, or to put it differently, what it means to live in a world that is conceived of as having environments in it, as opposed to one that is not. So there's a lot of political history of environmentalism, and there's some environment, uh, analysis of environment as a term, but very little analysis of environment as a political concept. Now, I will, would mention two partial exceptions. Um, one is a tradition of analysis, uh, particularly in French scholarship of the concept of milieu, but also in Anglo-American scholarship. A lot of it building on Conguillem's essay, The Living in Its Milieu. But much of that scholarship has little to no engagement with environmental politics, per se. And the other exception is some really recent scholarship, literally books that have come out in the past couple of months. One by Perrin Seltzer, The Post-War Origins of the Global Environment. One co-authored by Sverker Serlin, Paul Ward, and Libby Robin, called The Environment, A History of the Idea. And both of these works focus on the emergence of what they describe as the environment, with an emphasis on the definite article um, in the second half of the 20th century. And I'll say a little bit more at the end of my talk about why um, I think these are both useful and also partial accounts that we need to go beyond. In any case, it's this more fundamental investigation of environment as a concept that I want to consider in this talk. And this means not assuming from the beginning that there is and always has been an environment about which people can have varying beliefs and intentions, but it means putting into question the very existence of a thing called environment. Environmental historians and historians of science have been slow to take up this kind of conceptual critique, but scholars in other disciplines and domains have not been so reticent. And in fact, I would say that the concept of environment has been in quite a bit of trouble in recent years. A number of scholars have begun to argue either that it is no longer particularly useful or that it is actually actively pernicious, that it undermines our attempts to produce a more effective, just, or sustainable set of relations to other humans and non-humans that we encounter on the earth. And they suggest that other concepts would serve us better. I just want to give you some, a couple of examples. Donna Haraway, for example, has asked, this is a quote, what happens when the best biologies of the 21st century cannot do their job with bounded individuals plus contexts, when organisms plus environments or genes plus whatever they need no longer sustain the overflowing richness of uh, biological knowledges if they ever did? For Haraway, environment is a relic of an older ontology that scientists themselves are already abandoning without the need of any help from critiques uh, from scholars in the humanities. And we'd be better off, she suggests, attending to processes of sympoiesis and symbiogenesis, entangled processes of worlding. Similarly, Bruno Latour has asked, once you realize, quote, that the outside of any given entity, what used to be called its environment, is made of forces, actions, entities, and ingredients that are flowing through the boundaries of the agent chosen as your departure point, how on earth are you going to make the calculation of selfish interest and fit between an organism and its environment? Like Haraway, Latour suggests that environment has already been abandoned by those in the know and that this move is linked to our changing post-Darwinian understanding of adaptation and evolution. And my third example comes from the political philosopher Jane Bennett, who has advocated for a vital materialism as an alternative to conventional environmentalism. She writes, quote, if environmentalism, if environmentalism leads to the call for the protection and wise management of an ecosystem that surrounds us, a vital materialism suggests that the task is to engage more strategically with a trenchant materiality that is us as it vies with us in agentic assemblages. And it's important to note here that although Bennett's target is environmentalism, her critique does not operate on the level that most critiques of environmental politics do. That is, the level of disputes over the urgency and methods of environmentalism, the kind of critiques that the Republican Party mounts, but also, I would say, critiques that come from the left of environmentalism. Rather, Bennett is questioning the ontological foundations of environmentalism, suggesting that agentic assemblages would serve us better or would lead to a better politics uh, than organisms and environments. And I could add further examples from a number of scholars, people like Tim Ingold, Stacey Alimo, Michelle Murphy, Timothy Morton, and many others, probably you can think of others as well, um, each of whose critiques of environment has its own uh, sort of nuances and subtleties, but I think that the overall gist remains more or less the same, and that gist is that the concept of environment no longer works for us or should work for us because it's predicated on an ontological distinction between, on the one hand, what Haraway calls bounded bodies or what are sometimes identified as liberal subjects in a very broad sense or bounded individuals, and on the other hand, so a distinction between those kinds of subjects 
And on the other hand, the passive, passive mechanical or non-agentic surroundings that condition their lives. And so we now know these scholars argue that bodies are not closed but permeable, that organisms are far from self-contained or self-organizing, and that humans in particular you know, are constituted by various non-human forces and entities within them. We can think of retroviral DNA and micro, our gut microbiomes and endocrine disruptors and so on and so forth, and by flows of energy and matter that are passing through us. And so these criti critics basically argue that w once we realize that the concept of environment, which is linked to a concept of a bounded body or a liberal subject, once we realize that that doesn't describe the world we actually live in, we need to abandon it. They are not always very clear about the form that a satisfactory post-environmental politics would take, um, or at least I'm not particularly satisfied with composting, co cosmopolitics, but vital materialism, and lots of the, the options that have been offered. That might be my problem, not theirs. Um, but the point I want to make is that the, they're going beyond simply suggesting that we do environmental politics differently or to suggest that it's the environment itself that is, is the problem. So while I think, um, I find these critiques uh, compelling, I think it's worth pausing before we toss a venerable concept such as environment out of our conceptual toolkit entirely. And not only because of the strategic value of the term, which continues to carry weight among research sponsors and university administrators, among others. I think it's worth slowing down to ask, are these scholars <coughs> right that environment as a concept is founded on the idea of a rigid distinction between bounded bodies or autonomous liberal subjects and the field of objects or forces that, and, that surrounds them and makes their lives possible? Are they right that the concept of environment is no longer useful uh, or appropriate for our current predicament? And to give the game away um, a little bit in advance, uh, my answer to the first question is sort of, and to the second one is probably not. So that is, I think it's undeniable that the concept of environment does depend on the distinction between entities and their surroundings. I think if you want to give any kind of conceptual weight or substance to that concept, you need some kind of distinction like that. But I would argue that the entities that are surrounded need not be understood and indeed have not always been understood as bounded bodies or liberal autonomous enlightenment individuals in the strong senses in which Haraway et al. suggest. And in regard to the second question about the utility and appropriateness of this concept, I think there are certainly some circumstances today where the environment is not useful as a concept. And indeed there may be more such circumstances than there used to be. Um, but there are others in which it certainly is useful and will continue to be. And so rather than abandoning it entirely, I think our challenge is to reconceptualize it as a useful non-universal. That is to figure out where and when it could be good, a good tool for the purpose at hand and where and when it, it isn't. <clears throat> so I want to say a little bit more about my answers to those two questions. Um, and so let me start with the first question, whether adopting the environment as a concept a uh, kind of key structuring political concept necessarily um, depends on a belief in the universality and sufficiency of the ideas of bounded bodies and liberal subjects. And to do so, I'd like to provide two examples to discuss two well-known figures in the history of science separated by about a century who both embraced the concept of environment and indeed cri played critical roles in its development and adoption, um, but who conceived of the environed entity in quite different ways. So the first is uh, Georges Cuvier, whose conception of the organism clearly <coughs> illustrates, I think, an understanding of environment based on bounded individualism. So building on the work of 18th century naturalists like Buffon, um, at the end of the 18th century, in the first decades of the 19th century, Cuvier, as is, you know, I'm repeating stuff that I think everybody probably knows pretty well, you know, Cuvier elaborated laws of comparative anatomy that linked the structure of the organism to its mode and conditions of life. And I, these, these, this set of claims were, I think, just as essential as his colleague Lamarck's um, theory of species transformation to the 19th century articulation of the concept of milieu. Cuvier also famously, I mean, famously would be not the right word, but uh, described the living organism as a, quote, continual vortex of which the direction as complicated as it is remains constant as does the type of molecules that are carried along with it, but not the individual molecules themselves. In other words, to use a kind of an anachronistic term deployed by Haraway in her critique of environment, Cuvier saw the organism as a kind of autopoietic entity that impressed form on matter available in its surroundings in a way that allowed it to survive and reproduce itself. And I think it's entirely fair to see this as a kind of material biological instantiation of an enlightenment vision of a liberal autonomous subject confronted by a passive world of materials that it then transforms into its kind of dynamic and vital um, organization. And this may well be an understanding of the organism that we, we might want to question or even abandon now that scientists have shown us 
uh, how much the organism, organization of the organism depends not just on itself, but also on others. But let's move forward now, um, a, just over a century, to another person who played an important uh, role in the development and adoption of the concept of environment, and who indeed approvingly cited Cuvier's description of life as a kind of structured and structuring vortex. Namely, somebody I mentioned yesterday in uh, one of my comments, the Russian mineralogist and biogeochemist Vladimir Vernadsky, who's best remembered today for his elaboration of the notion of the biosphere, which was a term first introduced by the geologist Edward Zeus in the late 19th century. <clears throat> Now, the concept of environment was central to Vernadsky's thought. Indeed, in the 1920s, he reproached the biologists of his day for having lost sight of the importance of environment in their focus on the internal mechanisms of the organism. But one looks in vain through Vernadsky's work for something like the kind of autonomous liberal subject or bounded body that is the re subject of recent critiques. For Vernadsky, it's not the separation between an entity and its environment that matters or the capacity of the individual organism to organize itself but to borrow Latour's language, precisely the quote, forces, actions, entities, and ingredients that are flowing through the boundaries of the, ag of the agent. Nor does Vernadsky, who was not very interested in Darwinian evolution by natural selection, spend much time worrying about what Latour describes as the calculation of selfish interest and fit between the organism and its environment. Rather, he envisions organisms as momentary concrescences of living matter, or to put it a different way, catalytic nodes in a planetary process of energy transfer and chemical transformation. And perhaps the one place where Vernadsky does get close to some kind of liberal subjecthood is his discussion of the noosphere and a, a concept he begins to adopt in the late 1920s. It's the idea of an emerging planetary consciousness um, that is in the process of reshaping uh, the biosphere as a whole. But this is a strange kind of subject. It is a singular planetary distributed subject constituted not only by an individual will, but also by technology, geology, and chemistry. Um, and I think you have to do a lot of <coughs> distortion to, to align this, this notion of the noosphere with a kind of, the kind of liberal subjects and bounded bodies that have come under critique. So if for Cuvier it was the organismic vortex that gave structure to unstructured matter, for Vernadsky you might say that its vortex is all the way down and up from the level of the cell all the way up to the cosmos as a whole. And each of these structured vortexes can be considered individuals, but we're very far here, as I've already said, from bounded bodies and enlightenment subjects. And nonetheless, Vernadsky was a profound thinker of environment uh, with a formative impact on the development of ecosystem ecology, the idea of Gaia, uh, developed since the 1970s, um, as well as the more recent notion of the Anthropocene. So the point I want to make by contrasting um, Cuvier's and Vernadsky's conceptualizations of environment is really a very simple one. If we're to take environment as a concept seriously, that is of having some kind of uh, content of its own, and then it probably does require us to posit the existence of some kind of uh, entity that can be environed. Uh, but the idea that that entity is necessarily a bounded, autonomous, liberal, enlightenment subject, or that it necessarily has to be connected to the evolutionary and genetic logics of zero-sum competition that we're familiar with from kind of late 20th century, mid 20th century um, evolutionary theory, as, as Latour suggests, I would argue this is a straw man that's influenced by concerns of the very recent past, uh, rather than uh, uh, an attention to the much richer, more capacious um, history of environment as a concept. Of course, uh, if you want to take a radical position against the existence of individuals, per se, um, then I don't think environment is the concept for you. <laughs> but the value of getting rid of individuals as, as basic concepts is hardly self-evident or indisputable. And if we're not convinced that we need to go that far, which I'm not, uh, I think there's ample room for a concept of environment that requires some notion of an individual, but doesn't require that individual to be liberal, bounded, or anything else in particular. And so I, I read Haraway et al. as asking us to reimagine what it means to be an individual in relationship to forces, entities, other things around us, and not to jettison individuality entirely. And so therefore, their rejection of environment, uh, I would diagnose as the kind of um, result of slipping too quickly from individual to liberal individual, from body to bounded body. And this is the sense in which I mean that they're sort of right, that they're diagnosing a problem with a, a kind of way of thinking about environments, but they're not diagnosing a problem with environmental thought per se. Um, let's see. Okay, so let me turn to the second question uh, that I posed at the beginning, which is, are the critics of the concept of the environment right that it is no longer useful or appropriate for our current predicament? And my answer is probably not, as I've already mentioned. And I think this is the case even, with, even if you accept their claim, which as I said, I'm, I'm, du I'm dubious of, uh, 
that adopting the concept of environment necessarily entails dividing the world up into bounded or liberal individuals and their passive mechanical uh, surroundings. <clears throat> uh, am I talking loud enough? Should I talk? Is that okay? More, more loud? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the, the problem here with this second question is a problem not of, it's a different kind of problem. It's a problem not of slippage between the idea of individuals or bodies in general and a particular liberal or neoliberal form of understanding <coughs> individuals and bodies, but rather a problem of how to understand the utility of a concept like environment. Whether we should see it as a description of the world, which can be judged accurate or inaccurate, or whether we should see it as a project for the world. If we see environment as a description, then of course it's fair to argue that it's a bad description, that in fact the world cannot be neatly divided into individuals and their surroundings, that on the contrary, all individuals are so thoroughly entangled with other individuals and forces that any line we try to draw between them would do violence to reality. But if instead we see environment as a project, as a guide to reshaping the world in a particular way, then those criteria no longer apply. As a rule, the world as we encounter it might well be entangled in the ways described, such that organisms plus environments or genes plus whatever they need, as Haraway says, are often or even most of the time inapplicable. But that's not really the question. The question is whether the world has been or could be refashioned under certain circumstances and conditions so that distinctions between individuals and environments could be made locally and whether it would be useful and good to do so. When we look at the actual history of environmental thought, and praxis, what we find is many examples of the concept of environment being used mainly, if often implicitly, in the second sense, not in the first sense. That is, not used as a description of the world, but rather as a project for the world. And we find that the concept has been a powerful tool for certain people for constituting identities and communities and articulating aims and values. Let me just give one example of potentially many, and it, it concerns, this is something that I write about at length in my book project, it uh, is the urban reform movement of the late 19th century and early 20th century in the United States, particularly the form adopted uh, by the middle class settlement house movement, whose best known example uh, in the United States is probably Chicago's Hull House, which was led by Jane Addams from 1889 until her death in 1935. A subject that has been written about a thousand times by, um, by historians of um, urbanization and of social reform but I think without sufficient attention to the conceptual foundations of that reform. So influenced by the progressive evolutionary theory and pragma pragmatist philosophy of the day, Adams and her colleagues were explicitly environmental thinkers. They conceived of their work in direct contrast to earlier philanthropic and moral reform projects that focused on the redemption or salvation of the individual. Instead, arguing that individuals in a democratic industrial society such as the late 19th century United States could only survive in healthy and supportive environments. And that's what they tried to do. They tried to create or improve environments for the mostly working class immigrants of Chicago's near west side. And they conceived, and this is very, very important, they conceived of environments not only as the physical environments, the crumbling tenements and the dirty streets, the kinds of environments that had concerned earlier um, uh, public health advocates and, and sanitary reformers, but also as the social environment, the environment of temptations to vice, the saloons and the brothels, and the environment of a corrupt municipal government that was unable to provide effective services. I emphasized in my description of their, their aims the democratic and industrial uh, nature of the society that they were engaged with as part of a critical part of their conception. And this is really an, not an accidental, but really an essential part of their understanding of uh, environmental reform, which focused on the built environment and also on the institutions of modern urban life. I think they had no doubt that such, uh, that individuals in general, could survive without such environments, and in, indeed even thrive without them. But what they did doubt is that they could be good, democratic, modern citizens. So my point, and it, maybe it would take more work to, to flesh this out, is that a certain kind of political individualization was the intended outcome of their project of environmentalization or environmental reform rather than some kind of presumption about the already existing ontological structure of the universe or the structure of human society. So to borrow a term that Adi introduced yesterday in response to Laura's question, they were performing a concept of environment as a project imbued with normative content, not just as an objectively true description of the world. So even if it would be fair to accuse them of being liberals, of trying to create liberal subjects, which I guess you could do, although they themselves, strongly influenced by European socialists, saw a lot of 
distance between what they were doing and what the liberals at the time were doing. Um, I think it would be unfair to accuse them of misunderstanding the world as consisting in advance of bounded individuals along with their passive or mechanical, or mechanical environments. The most reflected of, of them, including Adams, understood perfectly well that many of the people they encountered and were trying to help were not yet individuals in the way that they hoped they, could, they would be, that they in fact lacked many of the, the necessary virtues and skills to construct and maintain their individuality in democratic industrial societies like the modern US. But they also had faith that their own project of urban environmental reform, which was simultaneously physical, biological, and social, that this project could help make them individuals right, and provide the conditions for them to flourish. So we can critique them for all sorts of things, including their paternalism and sometimes their racism and other things, but not for their ontological naiv naivete. Um, and so, uh, let me see how I'm doing on time. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess just to, to sum up this sort of section more broadly, when we, when we see scholars critiquing the concept of environment for assuming the existence of certain kinds of liberal uh, bounded subjects, it's, I think we can take it as a fair warning of the risks of overextending the concept or of taking it as a project capable of universalization, uh, but we shouldn't take it as a fatal critique or as an accurate description of all actual historical and contemporary projects of environmentalization. The question is not whether the world consists already of individuals and environments, but under what circumstances it would be good and useful to foster the emergence of certain kinds of individuals in certain kinds of environments. Okay, uh, now to conclude. <clears throat> So what kinds of individuals and environments do we want? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, this is the part where like, my political analysis falters. Um, I do want to uh, share with you some thoughts about one particular political context that I know a little bit about, which is the political context of academia, and particularly the emerging interdisciplinary field of the environmental humanities. So in recent years at the University of Pennsylvania and many other places, I think also here at Brown, um, the environmental humanities have been flourishing with new initiatives, programs, um, courses, some cases even um, uh, minor programs and, and so forth. And one reason for this uh, uh, flourishing of the environmental humanities, I think is certainly a resurgent environmental movement that has recentered itself on concerns about global change and environmental justice. Another reason is probably a sense of institutional weakness among the humanities that has made any connection to a STEM topic, including environment, seem like a good way to justify um, English literature or whatever, uh, or history, um, to students and administrators. And then there, there may be good intellectual reasons as well. For instance, I think a post-linguistic turn, turn to materiality for which environmental topics and approaches seem well, well suited. But in, for whatever reason, environmental humanities are flourishing. And ironically, some of the scholars that I quoted at the beginning of this talk, Haraway, Latour, Bennett, also Morton, Alimo, Ingold, others, are foundational figures for this emerging field, this part of an emerging canon in the environmental humanities. So in other words, the environmental humanities is built, is built on the work of scholars who seem to think that environment is a bad concept. So how should we interpret this apparent contradiction? Probably the most straightforward way would be to say that people don't take concepts seriously <laughs> or people don't take terms seriously. So there's a lot of strategic use of terms like environment. Uh, and so I think everybody probably rec recognizes the practical utility of environment, which gets administrators on board, students excited, colleagues showing up to meetings. Um, and at the end of the day, it's enough to, f to signal some productive affinities and maybe establish some new connections. So much of the work in the environmental humanities might thus be said to be environmental in name only. It has something to do with conventional environmental concerns like pollution or with materiality or with non-human or with uh, contextualized social understandings of health or with a critique of liberalism or whatever, like, and so on and so on. But searching for some kind of deep conceptual unity amongst these things might be a fool's errand. I think it's actually a completely legitimate way of using a term to gather people into a room for interesting conversations. And I think it's, this is actually what is often happening. That said, I still think there's some value in thinking uh, about the concept and trying to articulate a cl clear conceptual basis for this emerging field, or at least to have a, a serious conceptual conversation among people who, who want to have such a thing. Um, and in that case, the question is what kind of environment do we want, or how do we want to have those conversations about what the environment really is? And I think the answer has to be a pragmatic and a pluralist one. So when people tell us they're trying to study or save the environment, we don't simply want to start arguing with them over whether the environment needs saving, and if so, how, right? Just replicating existing political disputes. We also don't want to try to force on everybody or try to establish some kind of artificial consensus around what the concept really means, right? 
I think what we want to know is why a particular project of environmentalization that one of our interlocutors might be suggesting, why that is suitable for the circumstances and the problems at hand, and what kinds of individuals, bounded, sympoietic, uh, collective, so, so forth, what kinds of individuals it would be necessary to foster in order to make that project of environmentalization successful. And it's for that reason that I find some of the more re recent scholarship on the emergence of the environment in the late 20th century. Uh, I mentioned Perrin Seltzer's work, uh, also a co-authored co book by Serlene Ward and, Ro and Robin. These are extremely useful. I've learned a ton from them. But by, by focusing on a moment when the environment becomes conceptualized as singular, as unitary, and to some extent as non-relational, as existing sort of out there in the world without actually ever being brought into relation with any particular um, entities, um, I think these provide us a useful historical view of a particular moment and a particular mode of thinking environmentally. But they don't provide us a very good guide for thinking about the environment in general over its long history. And they don't provide us a particularly good guide for moving forward. They, on the contrary, return us to some of those old disputes over the urgency of environmental crisis and the necessity of using one method or the preferability of one method over another, rather than asking us to really think deeply, what kind of environments do we want? What kind of environmental uh, environment entities do we want to foster? Um, and so I think in the context of the um, Environmental humanities, that means not us, uh, beginning our conversations with the assumption that we all share a common object of concern, but rather beginning our conversations with the assumption that we all are engaged with a common concept, and our task is to find out how each of us is operationalizing that concept and what kinds of political commitments our choice of operationalization has. So not how can we use the humanities to help save the environment, but rather what kinds of individuals and environments do we need more of to achieve which aims in, ser in service of which values. Um, and I guess I'm out of time, um, so let me just uh, uh, wrap up by just summarizing again that um, I think to think deeply about environment as a political concept, we need to avoid both replicating existing political disputes, taking sides, pro or con, um, and also avoid a kind of conceptual imperialism where we impose our concepts on others. Um, and start every conversation by saying, which environment do you want, <laughs> right? Maybe I'll stop there. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? Is this good? All right. Um, so I just want to start by saying thank you um, to Lucas and Adi for the opportunity um, to be here and to be thinking with so many people who shape my own thinking and um, really having a chance to think a little bit differently about um, what it means to take politics seriously than those in my profession, the profession of many of us, um, history of science, often do. Um, and so I've really taken the injunction of, of this as a kind of creative space, a, norm, a potentially normativizing space seriously. And I'm going to depart from the kinds of um, approaches that um, we've been negotiating so far um, and do something a little bit polemical um, and a little bit personal. Um, so, but I, w I do want to say that um, I'm really grateful to be on this panel with Etienne, um, in part because we've been talking for a long time about ideas and what I have to say about um, the future I think follows really naturally from the conclusions you're reaching about the environment, um, this sort of problem of a singular totalizing way of thinking about this concept as opposed to um, even an embodied or relational um, and locally specific emergent notion. Um, so some of you will know that um, I've been engaged for the last I don't know, very long time, um, on research on freezing life, um, efforts to freeze life. In particular, the book that Tim mentioned um, deals with Cold War efforts to collect and preserve um, blood from indigenous peoples all around the world for the future. Not the future of indigenous peoples, but the future of a kind of unified, um, universal man um, of the kind that Etienne was pointing to in books that consolidate the environment in the age of UNESCO and the emergence of these international organizations. Um, and from doing, I, I didn't 
intend to become an expert on freezing, um, but it's turned out to be a quite productive concept um, itself for thinking about um, the consequences of the compression of experience and expectation into linear and singular temporalities, like the past followed by the present followed by the future. Um, and it's this kind of particular configuration of what is to come of the future that I'm going to take issue with today. Um, it's a political concept that I believe is in desperate need of revision. I dare say it is obsolete. Um, the future, in actuality, isn't a place or even a time. Um, it's too often a paradoxical expression of the desire for things to be other than they are right now, while ensuring that they remain exactly the same. This kind of future leaves me cold. It's one that casts innocent youth as saviors. It perpetuates itself often by cannibalizing its young and others, as well as those who slavishly worship it. Look at what's happening in Silicon Valley now. So these properties of the future are perhaps most intimately, and I'm interested in these intimate expressions, um, intimately expressed by the entwined or in the entwined realms of medicine and life science, which are the fields I know best, and their fields of expertise that often promise to eradicate disease and achieve immortality, or at least the radical extension of life. Um, the medical marketplace, as we all know, offers a staggering array of diagnostics from MRIs and genetic tests to sonograms and radioisotopes. We have antibiotics, birth control pills, drugs that treat and even prevent HIV, organ transplants, so on, so on, so on. Yet, um, America, at least, and arguably other countries, are not measurably healthier um, for having these innovations, and many of its citizens um, and people who live here and elsewhere can't afford medicine's increasingly high costs. So I I am concerned with this apparent, apparent paradox that biomedical innovation doesn't seem to produce equivalent bodily and social well-being. And more recently, I've become interested in what this problem looks like when viewed through intergenerational obligations, um, how parents project expectations onto their children, and how children grow up shaped by the hopes of their parents. Um, and that's what I'm going to focus on. But I, I also want you to be thinking about this pervasive, um, enduring rhetoric of future generations, which is so often invoked in an environmentalist politics. Why do we have to save the environment for future generations and who are those generations what is a generation I'm thinking about the recent work of Dan Bauck trying to problematize and think critically what is a generation um, but thinking about family dynamics and about childhood I contend is a powerful framework for thinking about historical change um, it's one kind of strategy for accessing an intimate mode of governmentality designed to ensure a particular kind of political power one that's in our moment, aligned with late industrial capitalism, biocolonialism, and neoliberal subjectivity. And it stands to reveal, as I've said, how the logic and rhetoric of future generations intersects or is it disrupted by the lived experience of members of those generations, not as demographic categories or phenomenon, but as people acting in the world. And doing so perhaps can provide inspiration for replacing this obsolete future with a more robust concept for animating political action. So I'm going to use some of my time um, here to engage in a form of historical and political self-experimentation, which might be more familiar as like autobiography. Um, as a once future adult, I have a narrative to share. Um, my goal in writing it was to ex help sort of demonstrate, take seriously not just what it means to critique a political concept, but to really think about the problem of how do we as historians of science or people with science studies or history of science expertise get our ideas to travel? Um, you know, how do we speak to other people than, than each other and ourselves? So I, I present this in that spirit. Um, and um, so I'm going to present this narrative from the, of, the, about, of an idea and an innovation-centric um, idea about the future from the vantage point of the child um, that I once was encountering the life sciences. Um, and I'll add um, that some of you are aware um, that I am quite pregnant um, with a child of my own. And I want to encourage you to incorporate that information into um, your reception and reflections of my account. I give you permission, and I encourage it. OK. So. The year is 1991, and everybody is talking about dinosaurs. 
A novel called Jurassic Park has just been published, and with it, Michael Crichton, a pulp fiction author with degrees in anthropology and medicine from Harvard, has written the otherwise esoteric topics of genomics and bioengineering into popular culture. I don't yet know much about most of these things, genomics, bioengineering, anthropology, Harvard, because I am in the fifth grade, and this is the longest book I've ever read. As a tween, I feel bad for the dinosaurs. They didn't ask to be reborn. I also feel bad for the paleontologists whose careers have been potentially made obsolete by the realization of fantasies they hadn't even dared dream. I mean, that was actually the rem remembrance I have of seeing the movie, too. I went to see, it was the first movie I saw without parental supervision, and I was like, I guess I'm not going to be a paleontologist. Like, that was my takeaway, so it tells you something. Um, <laughs> So the ability for these paleontologists to stand beside living creatures they had previously known only through excavating their bones from the ground short-circuited assumptions about their future. Science, Crichton seemed to be saying, can ruin your life, even as it grants you your greatest wish. Even though I don't know much, for an 11-year-old, I don't know nothing. I've recently spent a week um, with a troop of precocious peers on scholarship from regional public schools, pushing fruit flies around petri dishes with paintbrushes as part of a day camp, a summer day camp, to introduce kids to DNA. I've heard again and again, somehow, this activity is connected to changes that lie in the future. No one knows for sure what these changes will involve. It's part of the excitement, but it makes me nervous. Even though my mom says it's just fiction, Jurassic Park has got me wondering if the future I'm being prepared for just might eat me alive. It's a scenic 20 minute drive from my home in a town called Kings Park on Long Island's North Shore to Cold Spring Harbor, the site of the eponymous laboratory and its Dolan DNA Learning Center, the sponsor of my camp. The DNA Learning Center is directly across the street from Cold Spring Harbor's Whaling Museum, where I've been on field trips to learn about how early Americans developed technologies for transforming the giants of the sea into sources of wealth that made it possible for America to become independent and rich. As an 11-year-old, I feel bad for the whales that had to die for America, especially because now there aren't enough of them, not to hunt, but even to be awed by. And my teachers at school are saying we have to capital S, save the whales, because they might go extinct, like what happened to the dinosaurs. I'm relieved when I learned that Americans had nothing to do with the dinosaurs going extinct, but I wonder why so many people want to bring the dinosaurs back when maybe it would be better to just start with the whales. Little did I know that scientists in California were already working on that. That's another paper that I've written. You can look at that. Um, I don't love this DNA camp. My stomach tightens into a knot when I try to understand why I'm not having fun. Even though the instructors say there's no such thing as a bad question, mine always land with a thud. I want to know, for example, what's going to happen to these fruit flies when we're done with them? Why is it OK to kill them if you call it science? And what about the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, the ones that humans brought back to life? Why is it OK to mix the DNA of frogs with that of dinosaurs if you do it in a famous lab like Cold Spring Harbor, but not if you do it as um, Crichton's characters did in a secret island um, owned by a billionaire? And can we really be trusted to take good care of the dinosaurs when we've already messed up so badly with the whales? These kinds of questions seem to make my teachers uncomfortable. They are not the point. And as an overachieving middle class white girl, making people uncomfortable makes me uncomfortable. Maybe I'm just not that good at science. Only many years later, when I become a historian and not a scientist, I think the program helped a little, but it I took a Louis, um, do I start to think differently about my aptitude and about my discomfort. In 2005, I started graduate school in the history and sociology of science at the University of Pennsylvania. And a lot had happened in those intervening years since DNA camp. Most recently, that I'd spent um, the, pat the previous few years working as a risk communication specialist, an expert in helping people understand how to be prepared and how to be concerned about emerging epidemics and latent environmental dangers. I've become a professional storyteller who provides the narratives that make bits of facts matter to people who are worried about the future of their bodies and the landscapes where they grow their food and raise their kids. I go to grad school because I somehow believe that having a PhD is going to make me better at this um, or make my stories appear more credible. 
And maybe it turns out that something, it's something, maybe the only thing I have in common with some of the most important figures in the history of science, from people like Darwin to Rachel Carson, their facts I learned weren't worth much without the ability to tell a good story about them. So I decided to write my first paper about the emerging, then emerging science of genomics. Um, this was a moment when people were not sure, like, what is the distinction between genetics and genomics? Like, is there a difference? Like, what's going on? In particular, I'm fascinated by the ways that DNA is being used to tell stories about the past. National Geographic has just launched its genographic project, which claims to be able to tell me about my ancestry if I send them a vial of saliva. Apparently, I'm going to find out who I really am and where I come from. I'm suspicious, but I'm also curious. I'm going to get a biological story based on the comparison of my DNA with various indigenous people's DNA, people that I will never meet, um, that I can compare with the genealogical stories my parents have told me. So I have to wait for like six weeks to get my results, and I spend them reading about the history of genomics or trying to figure out what a history of genomics would be. Um, but I'm, I'm, I start with history of genetics, and I'm disturbed to learn that eugenics is a big part of that story. Eugenics, I was taught in high school, was a pseudoscience used by Nazis to murder people who weren't like them. End of story. But this history is showing that eugenics was also a central part of how early 20th century Americans thought about the future of the nation. It was a legitimate, widely embraced science, and it was used to keep people ju judged unfit from reproducing. It involved forcing women of color and the disabled to be sterilized so they wouldn't make babies that channel challenged ideas about human perfection, ideas that were also shaping systems of mass production. Eugenicists wanted the babies of the future to come out of wombs uniformly, just like Ford Model Ts. They even had contests at state fairs to set the standard. I'm even more disturbed to see that Cold Spring Harbor Lab, the site of my childhood camp, was one of the most important sites of eugenic research in the world. Before it took on the name of its place, Cold Spring Harbor, the lab was known as the Eugenics Record Office. It was founded and richly funded by the Carnegie Institute at the turn of the 20th century, a time of virulent nativism and social anxiety, not that different from our own, a time when my Jewish relatives were beginning to make their way in Brooklyn. The Eugenics Record Office oversaw the development of a eugenic agenda that would later provide inspiration to Hitler, not the other way around. So it's that that makes me struggle to remember my, any discussion of eugenics at my Cold Spring Harbor DNA camp. What rushes back, though, are childhood feelings of inadequacy and anxiety. I remember vividly a boy with big glasses who spoke about mutations, which I now know are the random drivers of evolutionary change. He spoke about them as if he had been born with a gene for scientific intuition that I lacked. I remember it not being clear either why understanding how mutations worked required me to actually make them appear in fruit flies, which the boy insisted on calling by the much harder to say Latin name of Drosophila melanogaster. I remember that the task of sifting through these tiny insects, looking for evidence of the influence of my hand in their bodies, red eyes or double wings, reminded me of a game I'd played as an even younger child, matching sets of cards with the faces on them. Mustache man with mustache man, glasses lady with glasses lady, concentration, that was the name of the game. And I think back to the last day of camp when an old wizard had appeared. His name, he told us, was James Watson. He'd won a Nobel Prize for discovering the building blocks of life. And he told us that we, the children, were the future. Whitney Houston had also been telling me that on the radio on the way to camp. I believe the children are our future, she sang. Teach them well and let them lead the way. I was the future. I was being taught to lead, to solve problems I had not created. But no one ever asked me or any of my peers what kind of future we wanted for ourselves. <clears throat> Okay, we're back in 2005, getting my DNA, waiting for the results of my DNA tests, when I'm thinking about what else I already know about my past. I know that my parents moved to Kings Park from Brooklyn in the 70s. To them, this hamlet represented a quaint slice of the American dream. I learn after some digging at the local historical society that Kings Park had been founded as a utopian community in the early 19th century. This was news to my parents, who'd lived there for nearly 30 years. Nor did they know that when the utopian community failed after a few years, the seaside land upon which it had been established was bought by New York State for one dollar. And, and on this land, a massive asylum was built. 
a total institution where many who arrived never left. It was named Kings Park because its earliest residents were overflow patients from the Flatbush Asylum in Kings County, Brooklyn. And in the early 20th century, its residents included those people at the eugenics records office as regarded as those without a future. And Ted Porter's new book on heredity in the madhouse actually um, goes just a teeniest bit into the connection between Kings Park um, Psychiatric Center, Kings Park Asylum, and Cold Spring Harbor, which is something I'm very interested in looking at more. The asylum didn't close until I was in high school. It was like a company town where the product was not, say, um, steel or um, uh, paper or widgets, um, but the containment of so-called insanity. Um, the asylum closed when a new wave of psychopharmaceuticals contributed to the deinstitutionalization movement. And it was in high school that I began to take some of these new pharmaceuticals to manage my own mental illness, um, as it was pit they were pitched as a more humane form of treatment than the electroshock therapy my grandmother had received for hers. Was this inherited? The DNA test I got back in 2005 couldn't tell me, but then already people were promising that in the future it might. And this is, um, I think, about Kaushik's work of, about being like patients in waiting or this sort of sense of, you know, this future where you're going to discover um, your own um, kind of pre-vivership, um, that, that this has already been lurking in you. So when my results do come back in 2005, Spencer Wells, the young blonde National Geographic explorer in residence and director of the Genographic Project, tells me in a little pre-recorded video that my ancestors domesticated animals and traveled out of Africa from Europe, or to Europe. I'm disappointed to find out that the story is even more vague than the one my parents have shared with me about my great-grandfather Theodore's voyage from um, Europe to Ellis Island. And I decided to access my results with my parents and sister peering over my shoulder. My mother remarked that she thinks, as, she, as I get the results, she thinks we have Native American ancestry, something the DNA test did not reveal and something she'd never shared before. We don't. Um, my father exclaims the results which show our animal domesticating ancestors passing through the Eastern Mediterranean prove we're really Jewish, except they also don't, um, especially since the DNA being analyzed only traces my mother's mitochondrial line. In other words, the stories don't match. The biological facts seem to generate new and even more fantastical stories. Science has disappointed me once again, and I begin to despair. Okay. We're back to the future, which is um, the, the kind of grad school present. I wrote my dissertation and first book on how technologies of freezing were used to transubstantiate human experience into living subs substance. And even as I argued that while it was possible to freeze that kind of life, it was not possible to freeze relations. And I, but I found myself nonetheless caught in a frozen future. And I'm talking about the hot new technology of egg freezing. This technology, designed to cheat the biological clock, involves having one's eggs extracted and preserved in liquid nitrogen. Women are told they can have it all by deferring their families until the time is right. And a few years ago, Google and Facebook took the step to offer their employees egg freezing as a perk. Pitched as a feminist and family-friendly move, these companies were trying to solve a problem for their female employees, supposedly, the challenge of maintaining a career while raising a family. This is a problem that in the post-war period earned the name having it all. And in the 21st century, Silicon Valley leadership believed that cryopreservation would make that possible. So did some of my colleagues at Yale. I was told that this technological innovation, intervention could serve me, a woman of reproductive age, on the tenure track. I was told this by faculty at the very institution that had hired me for my work in critiquing the way freezing had been used to standardize the future. <laughs> Once again, I began to despair. Many, including myself, have since observed that egg freezing is in reality a technological fix that's poised in practice to serve such institutions better than women themselves. Why, historians familiar with the technology have asked ourselves, was investing in egg freezing seen as preferable to investing in on-site daycare and flexible working hours or even pay for better pay and insurance for adjuncts? Um, quite apart from the fact that freezing an egg doesn't guarantee it will create a baby or be viable, what these companies didn't address in their fanfare is how they'd make it possible for their female employees to have it all several years down the line if and when they did claim their eggs from the freezer, let alone that no one was saying, like, let the men freeze their sperm for the future, although there's a robust practice that leads to whole other set of issues. Okay, 
So to many women, as well as people of color, the differently abled, LGBTQI people, um, continue to be subjected to this kind of an outmoded idea of the future, one in which technology alone can solve problems that we haven't even clearly defined, or they, and certainly not problems that they have defined. And while I'm not in the business of prediction, history does demonstrate that a future that offers technical, technological solutions unaccompanied by social, equivalent social innovations is one that's destined to fail. Why are so many tempted by a future predicated on deferring the present? An even more dramatic example than egg freezing, but one which still involves trying to manipulate time by lowering temperature, is expressed by adherence to transhumanism, a form of faith in the technological future in which humans will leave their bodies behind. When this happens, their minds, it is promised, will be uploaded to achieve a form of collective consciousness that is greater than the sum of its parts, and they too have invested in freezing as a way of preserving their bodies until the technology to accomplish this has arrived. This future is known as the singularity because it's seen as harnessing and unifying the cognitive power of the species. Transhumanism has many influential and technologically brilliant boosters, including those that have been influential in shaping our current systems of artificial intelligence. But their focus on the future has come at the expense of the present and from ignorance to the past. This transhumanist future is very much a singular one in the kinds of ways that um, the scholars that Etienne mentions are trying to reckon with, poised to serve those who are eager to leave their bodies behind and who imagine that the best society is one where everyone is literally of the same mind. Transhumanism is an example of a negation of relations, not only of reproduction. Um, there's been scholarship that's shown that a lot of people that choose to have themselves frozen don't have children. In a sense, they become their own kin. Um, they're investing in themselves as their future children when they are thawed. Um, it's an example of a negation of relations, not only of reproduction, but of relating to forms of life that are not human. It's a profoundly conservative view of humanity in that it seeks to preserve an older idea of consciousness, even as it purports to represent something radically new. It denies consciousness to anything other than humans and the machines they create or become. This is an idea of the future that far from cutting edge also has its roots in the early 20th century in ideas about eugenics, a fact that is often strenuously ignored by contemporary transhumanists. Julian Huxley, brother of Aldous Brave New World Huxley, was one of its first proponents. He was obsessed with the idea of a more perfect human species who could control and direct its own destiny. His future was a deeply eugenic one. Today's transhumanists almost never mention Huxley seeking to present their movement as a radical future. With their backs turned firmly away from the past, they are blind to the historical fact that their future, when is essentially predicated on the deletion of diversity, is a violently failed past. Okay, so I'm gonna conclude. Um, I see my work as a kind of project of a history of the future of innovations around life itself which has given me a reason and a way to look at other ways of living very much along the lines of what Etienne is suggesting. Um, and in this, I've been inspired by feminist, queer, indigenous, critical race, and Afrofuturist depictions of relation. I'm thinking about the work of scholars like Kim Tallbear, Zoe Todd, Audra Simpson, Ruha Benjamin, Alison Kafer, um, that help us give different ideas of what relations might mean. Um, and as I've recollected for you the moments of despair and disorientation that, that characterize my own experience of what Donna Haraway calls a techno-science baby, um, I realize they provide portals to other worlds and other ways of being alive. In concluding, I want to offer some tentative thoughts um, towards a science that doesn't derive its politics from an obsolete idea of the future. Um, I think that historians of science are poised to do more than diagnose and disarm the future, and they can do this better when they engage with this broader set of intellectual resources, including their own motivations for writing and thinking, like why do you want to know what it is that you want to know, and who do you want to know it? So replacing the idea of the future would involve, um, and, and it would be, such an enterprise would be temporally neutral and that it wouldn't value what is to come more highly than what already exists. Related, it wouldn't assume that what already exists includes all the past possibilities of what might have existed. 
It would acknowledge that there were many possibilities, different possibilities unfolding simultaneously, and they already have, there always have been. It would be spatially collective, and that it wouldn't define its horizon in terms of an uninhabited or never-ending frontier, a la Vannevar Bush, or um, going back earlier, Frederick Turner, where resources are harvested in ways that undermine the livelihood of those who steward or produce or are those resources. And it would be finally um, relationally accountable, since the needs are varied and multiple and cultures of, innovation, cultures of innovation must be too. And it would be accountable not just to people, um, but to a wider range of life forms, including the non-humans with who we share this planet, with who we contemplate, as Etienne points out, what kind of environment we want to have, what is the project here. So the future is obsolete, and it's is not one of temporal frontiers, but of rescaling and reforming relations. The project of living can be approached with a renewed sense of possibility. In the meantime, you'll find me reading and writing true stories, histories, about forms of science and knowledge making that are for us, for each other, and not for the future. Um, okay, thank you. Um, two wonderful papers. We have uh, about 45 minutes, so who would like to go? Yes, uh, Kashik. Um, I don't, but I think I'm supposed to have All it. right, sorry. So, um, no, th thank you both for those papers. Uh, there's so much to think with there in terms of, um, of a politics of relationality, and, um, and so maybe this is directly engaging at the end with, with, with your paper, but it's sort of a, a provocation for both of you. And it's going to sound cranky because I'm getting crankier the older I get, but it's not crankiness with, with you, but with, with some of your interlocutors in ways that I hope us not to ungenerous, right? And, and, and in fact, I agree entirely with where you're going with this. So, so I want to think um, about some of the theorists that you're citing um, Latour, Bennett, and Gold, especially Haraway, alongside two people who have written about planetarity, which is Gayatri Spivak and Joe Masco, right? And, um, and when I think about Haraway alongside Spivak, you know, of, of course Spivak is making a post-colonial critique of certain ideas of autonomous individualized politics. And of course, like Haraway, for Spivak, this depends upon uh, ideas of indigeneity in some important way. But to my knowledge, Spivak's critiques never depend upon the critique of liberal individuality in the same way as all of these, you know, the, 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 as all of these others do. So I'm, I'm just wondering, what is it about so much of contemporary, especially American-based scholarship, that feels the need to rest a call for a relational politics upon a prior critique of liberalism, right? And I ask that uh, as, you know, as, as not an, a liberal apologist, but as someone who comes from a patriarchal casteist society and recognizes that liberalism for all of its flaws has equality as one of its central tenets, maybe not in America so much, but in virtually every other liberal constitutionalism in the world, right? Um, and in ways that many forms of relational thinking don't. Right? And, and what does it mean to sort of rest this upon a prior critique of liberalism when some of the most trenchant and sophisticated um, attacks on liberalism are coming from the far right? right? So that's, that's, that's one kind of, and, and, and this, when I think Haraway against Masco, and again, this isn't thinking, you know, this isn't a simple critique of, of relational forms of thinking. But um, you know, in the 1980s, when Haraway was making calls for relational forms of ecological thinking in large measure through the work of Lynn Margulis, right? Melinda Cooper then subsequently showed that it was precisely those kinds of relational thinking that the neoliberal security state was appropriating in extremely sophisticated kinds of ways. Right? And so when I think of sort of contemporary earthly politics, planetary politics, as Joe Masco has shown, some of the most sophisticated relational thinkers are hyper-technocratic, neoliberal science projects, right? Everything from synthetic biology to geoengineering, 
So, so I guess the sort of provocation is, you know, of course relationality is vital, but why is it that in certain strands of thinking there seems to be a sense of sort of clearing the ground of liberalism as a prior condition for this, in a way that Spivak never does, for instance? And, and given that relationality in itself can't be an end game because it can be appropriated by the most horrendous forces, how do we think, you know, with but also beyond, like relationality towards what, I guess? Um, those are, that's really useful, thank you. Um, it's also really big questions that I'm, I'm not sure I have an answer to. Uh, let me see. So yeah, so the, I think I mentioned at some point in my talk that, um, that there are certain kinds of critiques of like, of environmentalism that come from both left and right. And some of these critiques are in fact rooted in kinds of relational, kinds of relationality, right? And they're different kinds. So one kind might be based on a certain sense of like a, the importance of certain social hierarchies, right? Maybe from more from the, from, from the right um, that seem to be washed out by a particular kind of environmental thinking. And then from the left that a certain kind of environmental thinking seems to wash out um, real uh, differences in, in burdens and benefits, right? Environmental burdens and benefits and how those get structured unequally across society. So you can, you can be a kind of relational thinker who's all for the hierarchy or you can be a relational thinker who's all for justice and equality, right? Like, I, I mean, this is, this is, I'm just kind of in a way rephrasing what, you, what you've said. Um, and of course, you know, that is one reason why um, I think uni universalist versions of environmentalism that are based on the idea that we are all, you know, kind of one humanity, all exposed to the same risks, all like participating in the same um, set of exchanges, that, that, that those universalisms are very appealing because they push back certain kinds of, well, it depends on your politics, right? Like there, there is a move that you can, move, pull, you can be repelled by the right, right or left towards a kind of universalism that allows you to make those claims. And this is, you know, um, I'm sure there's, you know, political theorists in the room who could tell much better histories of, of those things. I mean, so my, you know, aim is in a way not just to say that environment is, should be thought of relationally. Because I think, like you said, that's not, that can't be the end game. It doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't tell you what, what to do next, right? Um, I think uh, my aim is to tell, and this might connect with, with Joanna's story in a way. Um, my aim is to, so in the book project that I'm working on, is to tell stories of situated groups, communities, collectives of people who craft environmental ontologies that <clears throat> respond to the demands of their moment and that implement the values that they choose, right? And that's relational, but it's not an unbounded relationality. It's a relationality in history, right? And, and to say that that is, the, that is the challenge that we confront now, right, is to also craft new ontologies for our moments, and, and that requires choosing values. So, I end up in a pretty wishy-washy place at the end, which is I don't say like what value you should endorse, right? right? But to say that to think environmentally is to have already chosen a value, right, that you, that you want to implement and that we should be talking about those values rather than escaping into some kind of domain of environmental discourse. And then, you know, the, I think the, I, I, would, I would just be tempted for the, the liberalism US question, just tempted to say that it's a pure, re I mean, this is like very naive, analysis that it's a pure reaction against the dominance of like neoliberal ideology in the US that forced that pushes all these US scholars into like anti-liberal mm -hmm. positions which sometimes verge on illiberal which sometimes verge on yeah. um, the close parallels circling wrapping all the way around from the left to the right yeah. right Where, but, anyway, but yeah anyway thank you for, for bringing that up I need, it's something that needs just add um, to what Etienne said. Um, I think on the question of relationality, right? Like, so Marilyn Strathern says, right, the relation is the smallest unit of analysis. So even in a neoliberal order, you have to be looking at where the relations are and how they work. And I think that that's an important 
maybe the most important sort of um, starting point for thinking through any of these sorts of questions is to not imagine that relations don't exist um, in those places, but to try to understand what constitutes right relation um, from in a sort of dominant political sphere, um, and what how does that map onto or disrupt or um, prevent um, forms of relationality that might actually um, admit or allow people to um, imagine or enact different kinds of imaginaries than the dominant ones that circulate, right? So, um, and I'll just say, like, in my own teaching, like, with undergraduates, um, I teach a lot of pre, I was talking to Suman about this last night, a lot of um, pre-meds or bio, you know, biomedical engineers that, you know, are, like, really jazzed about they take my class because they want to read like science fiction and they're like, oh, I care, I'm excited about the future, I'm going to go build that. And they've never, it astounds me every semester, they've never actually thought that they could refuse the future um, that has been offered to them, that they could say in a variety of ways, like actually, like, I don't want to go work in this lab on this molecule for this like pharmaceutical. Like there are other kinds of ways of doing science that speak more to the problems I'm wrestling with as a person coming of age in the here and now. So um, I think the question is is an important one to help clarify what it is we're talking about. When we're talking about relation. Yeah. Thank you for the great uh, talks. This is. Um, more for Etienne, but I guess maybe potentially for both. Um, so I like your, your uh, critique of the critique of environmentalism, and, and I want to go back to, uh, you mentioned autopoiesis. I want to go back to that concept of self-production. So Maturana and Varela say that organisms live within a boundary of their own making, and they have a whole story about how boundedness com comes to be. Uh, but, but boundedness or unboundedness is only one axis. You also have you also have an axis of determinism versus free will, for example. So my question is really, where does agency or free will come into a story about the environment? Because if you think of Maturana and Varela's autopoiesis, uh, one critique of them is that they are structural determinists. So forget about the boundedness or unboundedness. The, they essentially posit, they give an account where the organism is essentially programmed in a structurally deterministic way by its environment or the medium as they, as they call it. And so in that sense it's completely different from the liberal subject because the organism doesn't have its freedoms and, and agency and all that. So uh, my, my question boils down to where does agency or free will come into a story about the environment and is that important? Should we get rid of agency and free will? Just a small question. <laughs> Um. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you look at, um, yeah, I'm going to try to answer this a little bit historically rather than <laughs> philosophically. Um, uh, you know, if you look at Kong Yim's, like essay on the living in, in its milieu, you know, one of his basic critiques is that the milieu concept uh, develops in a direction that ends up basically deterministic. So it ends up kind of evacuating the phenomenological subject, subject and turning it into a kind of pure product of, of its surrounding conditions. And I think that's a legitimate critique of a certain strand of, of environmental thinking. Um, but, but not a, a complete one. Um, you know, one of the, so there's a, there's a really interesting development that happens in environment, I'm going to say environmental thought, or something, um, at the end of the 19th century where a certain kind of totalizing uh, evolutionary narrative, um, which we might associate with people like Herbert Spencer, right, which attempts to understand the entirety of the universe as a process of adaptation between entities and their environments, organisms and their environments, societies and their environments. Um, for, for, for uh, some of the people who are inspired by Spencer's work at the end of the 19th century uh, do go in a kind of determinist direction with that, where at the end of the day, the organism doesn't do anything except passively adapt and react to, to its surroundings. But there is, at the very same time, the emergence of, um, and this is something that, that Lucas and I were talking about uh, last night, um, the emergence of, of a sense that, uh, that 
it is kind of human kind of self-consciousness that introduces into this evolutionary system of adaptation a moment of, of agency, a moment of moments of choice. And I think, in some ways, I think Vernadsky, who, you know, who I talked about, is kind of building on that tradition and saying that at some point, the entire planetary system becomes a kind of self-conscious, self like a choosing entity. And there's a whole bunch of stuff wrapped up in there that I'm not sure how philosophically sound it is, or conceptually <laughs> sound it is, about, about where moments of like, choice and moments of free will get introduced into kind of mechanical, mechanical systems. Um, and I think at different times in the history of environmental thought, people have just pushed the balance from one place to another. And so Maturana Vidala is, a, is an interesting example of yeah. like, pushing the balance um, towards the determination of the environment. Um, you know, Comte kind of has also a kind of tends to put the emphasis on, on the, the emphasis of the, of the milieu. Whereas others are, are really about like, you know, you can look at niche, niche construction kind of language where, where the emphasis gets shifted in a different way. So I, I don't know. I don't think there is one answer. I think, I think at different moments, people have just taken this dynamic and decided to shift the locus of, of kind of agency or, or locus of determination from one place to another. It's a long way of saying it depends. Thanks. Thank you. It's a really interesting question. Uh, so that was fascinating. Um, I got a question that's kind of for both of you, though, in a different direction. It was really interesting to me listening to your talks um, and realizing that one of the concepts, there are many concepts we're not talking about, but it's interesting in this context that one of the concepts we don't have listed is life, um, which seems particularly relevant. So Joanna, um, you know, one of, the, one of the great lines from uh, Jurassic Park is life finds a way, right? <laughs> Um, and it's actually, it's a really interesting part of the film that distinguishes what life does as opposed to non-life. So a question that, you know, can be phrased broadly and you go wherever you want. Um, what is the future of life um, in your story as opposed to, say, a future of non-life? Is it a distinction that matters as much now as it did before? Is it something that frames your own thinking about how to think about futurity? Um, and then Etienne, the, uh, the same um, kind of topic, um, I was brought to it by thinking about Kropotkin. Um, and so for Kropotkin and thinking about mutual aid, say, in the environment, what you have there is, of course, uh, organisms that are distinct from their environments that are very much not liberal organisms, that's the whole point, it's an anarchist vision, um, but the way it's kind of set up in my mind is you have living organisms that band together against a non-living and harsh environment. So it's the Russian steppes, the climate of the Russian steppes that has organisms of various different kinds, plants and animals and so on, banding together. Um, so what you get there for one is an opposition between an external environment and any organism, but not in a liberal vision. So that's already kind of interesting. Um, but it is something that gives a centrality to life that you don't necessarily see in all of these critiques of the environment. So Latour does not have life versus non-life as his central category, but I would say that Haraway absolutely does, and does because she's a historian of biology who's been thinking along these lines for a long time. So I wonder, as a second part of this question, how much in thinking about environment you should be splitting apart and then maybe putting back together living environment versus non-living environment as part of what you're thinking about. Okay. Um, great. Thank you so much uh, for that question, Suman, because it allows me to talk about something that I couldn't address in here, and also which reflects what I thought I was going to do when I finished um, my book on freezing, was write something about death. Uh. Um, and then, but what I started to realize as I was dealing with this, and I was really inspired in some ways by um, the the work I had been drawn into in indigenous studies and indigenous theory um, is, is when I started to think about, um, take seriously the injunction, my own injunction to not um, just regard indigenous bodies as sources of the study, for the study of life, but as um, 
bodies of knowers um, who know things um, about the world, um, I started reading a lot of indigenous studies and indigenous theory. Um, and someone can't, like Kim Tallbear, who's sort of working at the intersections of indigenous studies and STS, has this amazing essay um, which she calls Beyond the Life, Not Life boundary. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for us to be taking seriously the work that that dichotomy, that binary has done for us in all of the kinds of ways that we've been talking about, um, from everything thinking about agency, but also from even the way the environment um, can be seen as like the inert geological, right, and the exactly. living biosphere. I think that's a really unproductive, unhelpful um, way of thinking and a legacy that we're still reckoning with. And um, if you go towards the other direction um, to synthetic biology, Biology, um, you know, okay, that would maybe nominally seem like a domain that's like, well, we're not thinking about the life, not life boundary. But if you look at what Kim has to say about what's implied there, um, there's actually a really incisive critique of the new materialists and Jane Bennett in particular, saying like, how can you start talking about a vibrant matter, a matter that's that's sort of more animate than itself without engaging um, other kinds of non-Western um, cosmos Technologies or belief systems, thinking about um, relations um, with, you know, maybe fossils not as um, inert rocks, but as ancestors, right? And that we have different kinds of relations with. Um, so I think that, um, you know, I'm really been trying to imagine. Um, as I contest these ideas of how the life is regarded as having a future and we are implicated in that future of thinking, um, and it's really hard to do, right? Because it, we're, when you start to try to think it, you realize how much of our own sense of our agency or free will is structured by a sense of life versus death or life and death as being distinctive. So I think you put your finger on what is a, should be a central problem for those of us who are invested in the study of the life sciences, science studies, and life, um, or just life in life itself. Um, and if, if we can start to work to figure out how to I at least start identifying where that, bind, that boundary or that binary is um, forcing us into a, seem a set of choices or a set of ways of imagining the world or imagining relations or enacting relations, and I think that's a really good first step. Um, and it's one that, you know, going back to, to sort of Creighton and life finding a way, there's a lot of different ways to read Jurassic Park, but there is, in a sense, a way that he does show us, like, okay, then, like, we think we're engaging in this, like, synthetic biology enterprise, but we're actually reanimating our ancestors, <coughs> and maybe they're not, you know, so happy about it, and we don't necessarily, we think that we're making the life for a particular kind of future, but think about transhumanism, one of the sort of, um, canards or whatever is that like you the people that freeze themselves for the future tend to imagine they're going to awake in a the, the the utopia of their of their dreams um and not say as like a protein source um so you know i think that um i'm, I'm grateful for your pulling that distinction into into the foreground of how we think about this thanks yeah a really yeah that's a, a really great question um i mean i think there's one way in which um, it, when I've tried to track the, the, the history of the, the concept of environment and its analogs in other languages, which I think, you know, in Milieu is pretty close, um, that there actually, there is something foundational about the life-non-life -life distinction to the emergence of that concept. You look at people, you know, of the generation of Cuvier, one of the things that they're doing is they're articulating a life-non-life -life distinction, which is also a disciplinary distinction, which is also the fracturing of an old version of natural history, which is, you know, like, you know, Buffon can write, Buffon can write the, like the epochs of the, of the earth, right? But, but a generation later, that kind of holistic, holistic vision is no longer uh, current, no, you know, no longer seen as, as the work of real science. And, and part of that is, is a life on life distinction. And part of that is saying life is that which organizes right. that, the passive matter, matter which, which surrounds it. Um, of course, that's not the end of the story. Right? So, um, and I think, in fact, I mean, the Vernadskian moment is, is a really interesting moment. And it also is one that gets followed on um, by the emergence of like, within the realm of e ecology, of, of ecosystem ecology. Mm -hmm. One of the things, the things that, precisely what, one of the things that ecosystem ecology is do is it's taking, I mean, Kropotkin is not the main interlocutor of like 1930s, 1940s ecosystem ecologists, but, but the kind of ecology that I think Kropotkin's in dialogue with, which would also include people like Frederick Clements in the American context, or um, 
uh, Vaming in, in the Danish context is, is it's a vision of, of life struggling against non-life. Mm -hmm. And what the ecosystem ecologists who are inspired by Vernadsky and others start doing in the 30s and 40s is they start saying, no, it's life, life depends on non-life, reshapes non-life, becomes entangled into systems. Post-war cybernetics and systems theory right, articulates a notion of individuals as organized systems that can be surrounded by environments right, that doesn't have to, you don't have to have life anywhere in that, in that story. Right? So I think it's a, there's, there's complicated twists and turns in, the, in that story of the life, non-life boundary and how it relates to environment. But yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, what, I, what I think is kind of interesting um, in, in pointing out that cybernetic um, inheritance is that, that that moment is the moment from which, from which Latour and Haraway emerge, right? Yeah. So we like think about um, Haraway as you know, being the author of the Cyborg Manifesto. We don't necessarily think about her um, as sort of a, a product of a certain kind of cybernetic thinking. We think about Latour as like actor network theory and we kind of forget that that's actually coming out of the, his own moment in that, in that phrase. And so I think that it, to maybe going back to Kaushik's sort of crankiness, um, <laughs> one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is like what do we, and I was talking to a couple of people about this yesterday, um, what would it mean to kind of have a social history of STS to accompany this interrogation of concepts that would allow us to do a little bit of a better job of um, recognizing the origins of the concepts that we think with, because of course Haraway's always saying like it matters what thoughts we think thoughts with, um, but there's something that's happened as these two at least theory, science studies thinkers have kind of ascended to this transdisciplinary role that their own histories have become kind of a face. Not that they've even tried, to, it's not that they've tried to hide them, but maybe it's a product of how concepts travel. Um, and so I, I just think that that itself, like that you're, the, the histories that we're telling about these concepts also invite us to rethink the, the thinkers that we're thinking them with, so. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, I guess I want to kind of continue to push on this, this line and maybe reframe it in some kind of ways around um, the environment and as a spatial concept and futurity as a temporal concept and what um, that kind of framework or division between them does in terms of um, ascribing one uh, or the other as either a, a forming a political ontology or a depoliticized ontology. Um, and so just to kind of um, expand that out of it, I think it's one of the major problems that, that the environment as a concept that you're getting at, Etienne, um, is the division between the investigation of what is and what ought to be the environment as a project versus the environment as a, a sort of ontology of relationality or, or something else. And um, I guess the weird thing that it does as a political concept is point away from the project, really, um, more often than it does uh, point to its politicization. And it's incredibly frustrating then if you're, <laughs> I, I, I guess I can't speak for the environmental humanities, but in environmental studies more generally, um, it's sh really quite shocking how a, a, a sort of uh, interdisciplinary field um, in a moment of like intense environmental change and crisis um, continues to actually depoliticize um, through the very concept of the environment, um, which should actually point us towards um, uh, something that's a historical site of struggle. And so I don't know if that's because it's spatial rather than temporal, and this is where I think, um, I guess I, I would be interested in creating space and to uh, investigate future or space times, um, let's say, uh, of which futurity might be one, and uh, which I think actually, um, uh, to get outside of the disciplinary framework that, that queer theorists have done a lot of um, important and interesting work around, um, especially thinking through um, precisely or trying to unthink through the ways in which futurity is grounded in a certain kind of um, uh, heterosexual understanding of the family and of reproduction and so on and so forth. And I think that you gestured at this but can maybe expand upon it. 
Great. Um, so I, I would just start, I think, I, I think that's another reason why I was kind of grateful for this juxtaposition between our concepts, because I think, um, you know, maybe we're, I'll let Etienne answer for himself, but, you know, I'm saying that, like, it's, it's a mistake to imagine future as a, as a, as a a temp strict temporal and not spatial, because actually the way that it's enacted is as a space, as, as, as in a spatial frame, and it's this sort of like um, um, reversal um, that happens that enables the gives gives the future its power and authority. Um, and I've just been kind of looking around, writing something else, and noticing how many of um, like scientific journals and things have their newsletter. It's like frontiers of science, frontiers of genomics, frontiers. And so this frontier merit metaphor has been more language or rhetoric is one that I've been really um, invested in trying to understand the work that it does and, and to dismantle it. And there are other scholars. Um, um, who have who have have been doing that too, um, but you know um, the the idea that the environment is a stat is a, is a place right that is not like temporal, which is I think Etienne's analysis shows that's not a productive way to think. Um, you know it, that's part of the, what's at stake um, in talking about these concepts. And in terms of the queer queer theory, and I mean I wonder if you're thinking about people like No um, Lee Edelman and like No Futurism. Um, you know I, I do think that there. There's a, a lot of different potentials and, and ways to go. Um, I kind of have I've struggled with Edelman as a kind of endpoint for some of these questions, um, in the sense that it doesn't his analysis, um, where he's 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 sort of saying that like his analysis falls kind of neatly into a sort of zero population growth, like rejection, like um, death of the human species, um, which. I'll admit to have, having entertained, I think that most people of our generation who have grown up, um, you know, being told that um, the, you know, the planet is ending and grown up with the inheritance of like the Ehrlichian um, population bomb, like that the question to have a child or not have a child by any means, um, or maybe other than a, a adoption, but to biolo make biological kin, let's call it, um, or biotechnological kin, um, is an inherently political question. Like, I haven't talked to uh, friends that haven't at least at some point been like, is it, should I be doing this, right? Like, because of, um, of the planet. And of course, we see at Haraway in her uh, most recent book, Make Kin Not Babies being the logo, that's kind of been, uh, it's like where, it, it brings me back to the point I was making earlier, like she's coming out of a certain kind of moment and we have to, and remembering the, that history or that inheritance that's inspired her thinking can help us to understand what she's saying. And um, I'll just sort of give a plug for, a, um, maybe some of you have seen this, this the, the volume that came out of a 4S panel um, responding to that claim and with um, people like Kim Talbert, Alondra Nelson, Ruha Benjamin, um, talking, it's make kin, not population. So taking up some of Michelle Murphy's critiques um, and saying that, you know, maybe it's not about um, how we, uh, it's a, not about reproduction full stop, but again, like what, kind, what constitutes right relation um, in the way in which we choose to undertake the project of biological um, kin making. And of course, I think there's a queer politics there that can go far beyond even just thinking about um, you know, reproduction as something like producing like an individual, like in your own vision, um, but also the forms of um, thinking about maybe some of Yarden's questions, all the kinds of microbial relations and, you know, other sorts of parts of relation that are implicit there. But I, I'm heartened to see, I think, that environmental studies has a lot to gain from engaging with those perspectives. Um, yeah, I mean, just a, a quick comment. I think, um, it's clear that sort of in the first instance or at first glance environment is some kind of spatial concept, right? I mean, it is usually used in that way. And at the same time, I think there is often a temporal component to it. I mean, I think particularly of languages of risk and deferred consequences that lead people to understand their present environments as somehow shaped by what will have come to light later or, um, you know, the, yeah. Um, and then on the question of depoliticization, I mean, the, the environmental humanities is deeply politi political and deeply politicized. Maybe that's one reason why the environmental humanities has emerged as its own sort of nexus of activity that's distinct from environmental studies programs. I don't know. Um, I would say that 
the environment as a concept per se over its long history has often been deeply and explicitly political. It's often been linked to political programs. I think even to the emergence of the modern American environmental movement, you can find ways uh, where, you know, you look at somebody like Murray Bookchin, so who publishes Our Synthetic Environment in 1962, coming from a kind of like anarcho-socialist background. Links, you know, he's linking it to industrialization, to labor, to, to the, the structures of a kind of modern liberal, you know, society, to, to war, <laughs> to imperialism. It's all it's deeply political. Rachel Carson, political in a way, but not the same way, right? And I think one of the, the nasty legacies of the successes of the modern environmental movement, and that success being to kind of frame environmental issues as non-political and universal, one of the nasty consequences is like a failure to recognize the deeply political nature of it. Um, and I think, you know, hopefully there's a way of, and I think that is what has led to critiques from both left and right of, environment, of environmentalism and environmental projects. So um, hopefully, yeah, yeah. So I don't think it's inherent to the concept. I think it's like a, one of the things we need to do is repoliticize it in a, in a deep way. Yeah. So this is addressed to Etienne. Thank you for a wonderful paper. Um, I was interested in the fact that you didn't touch on, um, though perhaps it's also part of your project, uh, the way in which the concept environmental participates in an intellectually complex and politically very charged set of dualisms of external and internal, uh, where we have the environmental as opposed to the genetic, acquired as opposed to innate, cultural as opposed to natural, fixable as opposed to fixed, <laughs> constructed as opposed to intrinsic. These all have uh, uh, political valences uh, in terms of social politics and intellectual uh, politics, and I thought you might have uh, touched on that uh, in, in your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I may have touched on it briefly in discussing like these urban reform projects, which shift from the more kind of moralizing the individual focus of earlier kind of charity and philanthropic efforts to focusing on kind of structural reform, right? I think, I think, I think that's a clear example of how environmental thinking has a, a, a very clear political implications, right? Um, yeah, but it's sort of, I feel like sort of this is the same answer maybe I gave to Yarden is that it's not always, that the dualisms do get generated, but it's not always clear how they line up or what position anyone will take on them. Even the question of fixability, right? So is the environment something that you can, versus the, let's say versus genes, is that something that is subject to manipulation? It depends on the technological affordances of the moment. Ab right? ab absolutely. Or, yeah. I mean, so the, uh, the next Point, uh, point would be that this has been very deeply deconstructed, a set of dualisms among the people whose work I would uh, invoke here would be Susan Oyama, mm -hmm. uh, for example, who has worked specifically on the, uh, when it takes the form of nature and nurture and uh, uh, works at this, you know, from the cell up to the cosmos uh, as a set of um, along other lines, the one that you just mm. mentioned, um, mm. that the opposition between the fixed and the fixable uh, is always uh, itself questionable on mm -hmm. both sides. Yes, I would mm. take the same line uh, as, as I would with various of the other dualisms that are, have been in play. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I, actually, I wondered if there was a version of Barbara's question that one could also ask to Joanna, because um, <laughs> it seemed to me that you you had a there was a sort of hidden concept in a way behind your um, analysis of the future, and that is in fact environment, and it's in the in the precisely the distinction between genetics and and the environmental as explanations for you know um, uh, I I individual individuality. So I, I wondered whether in fact you you know there was a sense in which your your real concept is in fact 
I mean, at the, at the, at the beginning, you asked, you, know, you, you asked this question, you know, we need a more robust concept for political action. But it seemed to me that one word for the, remote, the more robust concept of the future that you outlined in three or four different principles, including the spatially collective, could be in environment. Um, huh. Well, perhaps, um, but maybe only in the sense that um, Etienne has uh, redefined it. Because I, I was thinking, Barbara, as you were talking about um, epigenetics, right, which is supposed to be um, <coughs> the science of correcting against the central dogma of molecular genetics, this idea of genetic determinism, and that we can bring these, uh, we can dissolve this distinction between inside and outside um, and think um, more holistically or, or, or Di differently, um, and and I'm thinking about that in the, in the kind of history of ideas and and, and principles, of, but I'm also thinking about it um, in in terms of of history of what has happened to the epigenetic imperative as it's been practiced and and funded. Um, so epigenetics um, has achieved a certain kind of institutional success through its ability to marshal um, some of the kinds of claims about um, breaking down this distinction between inside and outside, but as people People like Sarah Richardson and Hallam Stevens and others who are starting to um, articulate these critiques have shown it's really um, again a kind of like a bait and switch the same way like the the sort of um, future is seen as like a maybe a temporal but it's actually a spatial um, that epigenetic is supposed to be pointing us to the beyond the outside but it's really just a way of kind of re continuing to intensify um, a certain kind of insight though it needn't be um, and I've been working with a really um, one wonderful student, Sue Park, who's trying to write a history of epigenetics going back to people like Conrad Waddington in the early 20th century um, through the, the interwar period into the 60s um, that's showing what epigenetics, so Waddington is seen to be the, the kind of person who coined the term epigenetics and he's the one that contemporary practitioners hold up as like their founding father figure when they give their potted paragraph histories of like who we are and where we come from. And what he's been discovering, looking at Waddington's papers and also Waddington's prominent career as a public intellectual, writing things like the scientific attitude and engaging in conferences with people like John Cage and Margaret Mead called Biology and the History of the Future and Chichen Itza, I mean, he's a fascinating figure. Um, that Waddington, what he was really imagining when he was calling for epigenetics was something a little bit closer to a kind of um, uh, critical science studies um, that involves the ideas of people like Margulies and Haraway. I mean, in fact, they are in this intellectual tradition. So um, there's something to be gained, um, you know, both by looking at the ways that those um, that those concept that the concepts are themselves, and I think this is Etienne's point in a lot of ways, um, the political work that the concepts are allowed to do. But I think we have an, a responsibility, especially those of us who are in, in this room and do the kinds of work that we do, to look at the ways in which that the sort of um, transformative potential or the liberatory potential that travels with these concepts may actually be concealing a more conservative kind of in, in Endeavor. Um, and so I think some ways that, again, it's like the life, not life binary. And I think, you're, I think your point is really well taken. Like looking at um, these binaries is important, but also the concealed concepts. There's always concepts within concepts, and um, you can't get, you know, get away from it. Um, and the future, you know, what even is, <laughs> what does it even mean to say, like, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching, talking about this concept of the future, and I've, I've come at this from a lot of different strategies, so this one was probably the most, like, performance already one, um, but, you know, I've looked at, like, how, um, anthropologists are collaborating with um, futurists um, in the 60s, um, which I presented at a conference that Peter organized in the spring, to see, you know, what exactly do they think that they have to gain from each other um, um, in, in these ways. And I think um, maybe the last thing I'll say is that there's something, this is a, maybe a disciplinary observation that bothers me and one that I've worked with a number of collaborators, most notably Emma Koval, to kind of overcome, is why it is that um, environmental humanities and like life science or environment and human, like the environment and the biomedical tend to be true 
treated separately. Um, you know, there are the people that do the environmental stuff, and then there's the people that do like the synthetic biology, you know, like, or like the, or the life science history. And those are starting to come together in some different ways, but it seems like, let's say, just like theories of biopolitics have something to engage and contribute, and maybe this even feels like an outdated mode, but it's, it's um, been striking to me that the way that the fields have been articulated are a little bit separate. It's not a given that people that go to like environmental history, you know, are going to show up and like um, talk about history of, of biology. And so these are just all these different divisions and, um, you know, constructions that we're in the business of trying to think about. And that includes, I guess, what I really want to say is always being attentive to the ways that we're drawing these boundaries. Because you can't not, you can't communicate without doing it. Um, but you're right, of course, it has to be there. It has to be some way of thinking beyond just like the gene or something like that. Yeah. Great. We have, yeah, we, uh, Peter and then, uh, and then Leela. So we have room for a lot, time for room, time for. <laughs> Maybe, maybe could we take both of your questions at once? Uh. Uh, one of the things that uh, struck me in some of the discussion with uh, Kaushik, Etienne, uh, Barbara, uh, and others was that m many of our concepts have in their concept of concept, so to speak, a notion of a linchpin. And uh, I worry about that. That is to say, as if there was a necessary condition that saturates the concept and that somehow if you could get at that one, you know, the linchpin is that little pin that keeps a wheel from coming off the axle. Uh, and that if we could somehow get to that one thing, uh, we would demobilize the, whole, the category that we didn't like. And I think that, you know, oftentimes the, the focus turns to, for instance, a notion of, I mean, not that it's a little linchpin, but the notion of, say, in, of individualism. And if we could get at that, then things would be better for the broader complex of things that wrongly gets subordinated to the concept of environment. You know, if we could somehow disturb the notion of individualism, just like we're in another category that that's often true of is that if we could get rid of nationalism, uh, you know, then we would, you know, but, but then the, the propositions for how you, what the problem, you know, how you get rid of it uh, leads to all sorts of uh, responses, um, you know, for instance, the Anthropocene, you know, oh, well, you know, you're, the problem really is if you can only get at the, pro the linchpin there, it's capitalism, and then the capitalocene, renaming it, that'll fix it, or uh, plantationocene, or uh, strulocene, or, uh, I mean, there, there are lots of different, you know, there's a chaos of words that we use to try to get at it, but each one of them has a target. There's like a particular thing that they're going to demobilize. And um, it seems to me that in the discussion, a very interesting discussion, Etienne, of some of the, the issues at stake with environment, uh, you know, Bruno Latour, had, you know, he, there's a linchpin that he's very often after, and that's some kind of bifurcation, which I, I take it, maybe right, maybe wrongly, to, to, to come out of a, a reading of Deleuze, not that Deleuze is mentioned so much by hmm. Bruno, but but I, you know, that the body without organs and that, that whole tradition that comes out of French philosophy was very suspicious of the division into these component parts. And a lot of Bruno's work is says, well, if we can get rid of that distinction into the inside outside, many things, um, then we'll, 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 we'll solve something. And, um, I guess I'm a little, you know, I mean, as, as Barbara's comment suggested, and you know, in, in ranging over the, all of the, all of the contrastive sets that are invoked about environment, and and you did in other ones in, in your in your discussion, I think that we see that there, it's very unlikely that a concept of environment actually has a little linchpin, which if you can take out, it's going to solve things. And even if in one of those, by, you know, those contrastive sets that Barbara mentioned, or that you mentioned, you could, you could find such a thing, and I'm not even so, I don't even think that's such a promising idea, uh, but certainly I doubt that there's one, that one linchpin fits all. I mean, you know, if you, this was the, this is the kind of problem that bugged Wittgenstein, you know, decades ago about categories like game or other things, number, uh, that there isn't one 
there isn't one necessary, let alone one necessary and sufficient subconcept of concept that picks out all and only environment. Uh, so something, but instead that there's, it's some sort of a complex of, or a, you know, Wittgenstein's language family, but you know, some kind of complex of notions that together offer some possibility for political action. And I, 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 I just worry about the attempt to, 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 to pick out, you know, that if we can get rid of individualism, then we'll, you know, we're saved. Uh, Where and, did you and, hear that? Sorry? Where did you hear that? From any of the people? No, no, who, no. I'm, who, I'm saying that, any, any of the people who spoke or were invoked I, I, in the discussion or asked questions. Where did you hear it? Well, for instance, I, I'm sympathetic to Kaushik's remark that we might, you know, there, 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 in all of the variety of ways that one picks out environment, he, he was saying, as I understood, that maybe it would not be such a good idea to see the environment as in opposition to individualism. Is that not something you were pointing to in, in work? And, and I was, so I, I'm not criticizing that. I'm saying, I, no, I mean, but I'm, you I'm are supporting. accusing people of some sort of I'm oversimplification and some sort of naive no, 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 search I'm not, for a not at all. I'm saying which would solve problems. I'm, I didn't hear that from I, anyone. I'm not. I'm saying, for instance, I invoked you uh, to say that, that, that it wouldn't be a solution to pick out a single thing to get at all of the concerns that you were mentioning. I was supporting that. I was supporting your remark in identifying the range of concerns that fall under oppositional Could, notions to environment but, and trying to build on that idea by saying, I did not think that isolating a linchpin notion was a good way forward. But, 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 I didn't think it was adequate until the day to get at the kind of range of concerns that you were raising or the particular concern that Kaushik was raising or the range of notions of environment that were brought up by Etienne. Maybe we could just have the last comment, Leela, you, you, you were going to ask something. And then we'll, oh, then we'll close well, down. I, I just wanted to uh, praise the imaginative largesse of both the papers we heard and to ask a, a truly not a facetious question, a question about your creative practice, both of you. Uh, that it seems that of all the concepts we've heard so far, uh, the two that you uh, discussed so eloquently are the least encumbered by, let me say, provisionally, the framework of modernity. Uh, and uh, this allows you to take certain freedoms. It allowed Etienne to say, what do you want? <laughs> and it allowed Joanna to give us a story. Uh, but, uh, and you say things like unbounded, and yet to come, and earth, but you don't say immortality and eschatology. Indeed, you barely whisper being. Uh, so I, um, I wonder how you feel the freedoms from the framework of modernity and the constraints, and whether your creative practice is in some way um, sketched out by sci-fi, uh, which allows you to say certain things but not others. You know, talk about mutation and um, uh, time travel, but really not about the afterlife. Um, um, that's, I, I'm really grateful for that question and the opportunity to reflect on it. Um, and I, it's interesting the way that you phrase it. I think it's, expli I, at least for me, um, I'm, try I'm reckoning with the, the encumbrance of modernity and trying to find a different way to make sense of what it means to supposedly be modern. Um, and um, absolutely, um, I've been <laughs> thinking with science fiction as a way um, of at least a, a set of imaginative creative possibilities for, um, you know, telling different stories about who we are and finding actually a lot of scientists who have themselves engaged in sci writing science fiction as a way to think their way into or out of certain kinds of problems of modernity. Um, the point about eschatology um, and, and death and immortality is one that deeply haunts the book that I finished um, because when 
I was searching for justifications of why my actors, these scientists, were so intent on their project of salvage. Um, the best reason they could come up with um, was a fear of death. Um, and it was not just their own, you know, their own, it was death because of the ambiguous and uncertain threats of ionizing radiation that had been unleashed with um, you know, the bomb, um, but also um, threats of industrialization, urbanization, um, and, and, a, and a sort of anxiety that um, they were now maladapted for the environment in which they live. That's the language that they used. So um, this sort of appropriation of a, a technology I think is almost emblematic of modernity, the freezer. It's like this product of thermodynamic, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the, 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 it emerges from thermo, you know, thermodynamic thinking um, and turning it into a machine for um, negotiating a kind of uh, um, apocalyptic um, idea and a vision of, of a certain kind of resurrection and, and deferral of death. Um, to me, seemed like science fiction, positively science fictional. Um, and so I think that's what motivated me in this particular space to say, okay, well, what does it look like to narrate a different kind of experience um, that maybe, you know, coming from the perspective, the naivete of a child who's nonetheless being inculcated um, into the norms and standards and expectations of a particular kind of modernity, where are those discomforts and resonances that might also show um, a different way to imagine how things could be otherwise. Thank you. Finally, yeah, I'll, I'll try to be brief because I know we're at time. But Peter, I, I totally take the, the point that, um, and I, I totally agree that searching for a linchpin um, in a concept in the hope that the, all the problems can be un, unraveled or the machine can be destroyed or whatever the, the aim is, that that doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and I'm, I'm particularly sympathetic because I think when I began this project, that's how I was understanding it, like that I could find that key, right, to unravel. Um, uh, but, um, you know, where I've ended up with is, is trying to really be, to understand a concept as deeply historical, imminent, and embodied, that there actually is, if you, you look at, um, you can trace genealogies, right, through all this stuff. You can look at Rachel Carson, she, who studied, you know, biology in the 1920s and learned stuff that was influenced by, like, uh, by Spencerian ideas, and Spencer, who was influenced by Kohn, and Kohn, who was influenced by, like, Cuvier and Lamarck, and, and the, you know, you could trace that lineage if you want to, but, but in a way, like, for me, what's much more interesting, and, and that's important, right, because that's why people end up using the same word and thinking that they're talking about the same thing is partly because they're drawing on the same sources to do it, but then each of them is, is really embodying that concept in a particular moment, in a particular speech community, with particular instruments. Right? Sometimes the instruments themselves carry the, the concepts from place to place. And so um, I don't think any of this, this really came across in, in the version I gave today. Um, but in the, in the bigger project, it's a, a, it's a deeply historicist understanding of what a concept is. Um, and of course, there is an analytic frame that I have to put on it to do some selective work. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to make that frame kind of as, as general and, and, and to put it as little critical weight on the frame as possible and instead talk about the actual, actually existing environmental kind of practice and thought. Um, so, but I, I take the, the point very much. And I, I thought that came across well in your paper. We have a luxurious 10 minute break. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks to our speakers and to everyone.